Florian from Neuro9 has a popular software YouTube channel, and in this course, he will teach you how to use the Vim code editor. What is going on guys? Welcome to this Vim course on Free Code Camp. In today's video, I want to guide you through a full Vim course from beginning to end, step by step. And I want to start out with some basic motivation, talking about why to use Vim, what Vim actually is, and also showing you a preview of what Vim can look like if you have some plugins installed and all that. And I want to do so because I think for a lot of people out there, Vim is this boring featureless text editor that you have in the Linux command line. If you don't have any alternatives on a server, for example, you use Vim. Otherwise, you don't use Vim and a lot of people don't even know how to exit Vim and all that. So we're going to talk about all this, why you should use Vim, why learning Vim can be important and interesting. And then we're going to move on to the installation, to finding the installation that you already have, to installing uh, Vim on Windows, for example, if you don't have it installed natively, we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to get into some basic key bindings, commands, into more intermediate key bindings, commands, to more advanced key bindings, commands, and so on. Then we're going to talk about macros and registers. And in the end, we're going to wrap up with plugins and NeoVim. So we're going to talk about how to build an actual sort of IDE or at least an advanced editor, something approximating VS Code or even better using plugins and NeoVim. So let us get right into it. All right, so let's get started with the motivational part where I'm going to show you or explain to you why using Vim can be interesting to you. And I'm not going to talk too much here. I'm just going to show you my setup and what I can do with it. And then you can decide if you think that's interesting or not. But before we get into that, I want to mention that this box down here um, is showing you what keys I press. So right now I'm in the terminal and I can type ABC and you can see that I'm typing ABC up here, but you can also see what I'm typing down here. And you can also see that if I press uh, backspace, for example, this is also locked here. And if I press enter, it is also locked. So whatever I press, whatever I type, you can see down here on the right, this is important, because a lot of times, uh, when I do something in Vim, you're going to see certain effects, but you don't really see what I'm pressing. So here on the right, you can see what kind of keys I'm pressing in order to do certain things. And I want to show you first of all, what probably most of you know, um, Vim is or no Vim looks like or think about when they think about Vim. And this is essentially just a VI command. So VI and opening a file, I have prepared a C file here client.c. And when I open this, this is what probably most of you know as Vim, just a basic text editor here, you don't even know how to leave it probably, uh, you don't know what to do with it, you don't know how to type with it, maybe you know how to type and how to leave but that's it. Um, this is not what I'm using on a daily basis when I talk about using Vim on a daily basis. What I'm using is NeoVim with a couple of plugins and with my custom settings and then it can look like that. So NVim client C. And this is what it can look like in the end. This is just a motivation. Whatever I show you here, you don't need to understand it yet. I'm going to show you maybe some key bindings. I'm going to show you some plugins. You don't need to understand them. I'm just showing you what you can do here. So first of all, you can see a different theme. You can see a different airline on the bottom here. So a status bar, you could say I can open up a file tree on the left here. I can uh, navigate through directories here. I can go back here and I can open up the tag bar, which is essentially showing me the functions, I can use my mouse to jump to certain functions. Uh, and since this is C, I think I'm also able to open up the man pages here. I'm not sure if that works or how that works. There you go, you have the man pages up here. Um, so this actually doesn't look like a terminal editor anymore. This looks like VS Code uh, in a different style. And the difference here is, of course, also that um, this is not this is not one editor that you download and it always looks like that and you can change the theme. This is my custom editor. I decided that I want to have a tag bar. I decided that I want to have uh, this file tree here. I decided that I want to be able to open up terminals by typing terminal split uh, bash. I decided that I want to be able to do that. There you go. Um, and I can also decide to uninstall these plugins and I can decide how, how I want to have my editor. It's completely customizable and um, I do all of that. So that's the editor itself. That's the customization. What I can do now is I can use so called Vim bindings, which we're going to learn about to do things more efficiently. For example, let's say I want to delete everything that's in between this, uh, this curly bracket here and this curly bracket, how I would do it in an ordinary text editors, I would go select that and delete this. What I can do here in Vim is I can let's say I'm here, for example, at this point, what I can do is I can just say, delete inner and then we're actually in this case, um, we need to do it here, delete inner curly brackets. 
and then it does that. Again, you don't need to understand the key bindings yet. We're going to learn about them. I just show you what I can do here. Well, let's say I'm here. I don't, uh, I, I want to delete, for example, the next three words. So static int get nth index. I want to delete them. I can just type D3W. There you go. I can undo here. I can do all sorts of things. I can just cut and paste using using the keyboard without using the mouse in any uh, complicated ways here. I can also do something like um, I'm here, I want to change everything inside of the parentheses, I can do it like that. So a couple of small things that you might think, first of all, are maybe complicated or not really relevant, because who cares if I can delete the word by typing CIW or uh, by by just selecting it with a mouse. But the fact is that I personally can say for my from my experience that I have enjoyed a huge speed up in my coding speed. So I think that I'm at least 300% faster, because you don't have to use the mouse most of the time. And even when using the keyboard, you can do things so efficiently. And right now you might think, okay, but typing certain characters to to change, for example, text inside of parentheses, isn't, isn't this kind of confusing. And it isn't in, in the beginning, in the first place, it's confusing. But then as as you train using Vim, and as you use it on a daily basis, at least the key bindings, you get used to it. And then all of a sudden, things get quite quickly. So for example, I want to change the loop here. I'm working right now, I don't even think about it. I just type CI parentheses, of course, not in the insert mode, CI parentheses, and there you go, I change this. Or, um, I don't know, I want to change the line here, CC, I change the whole line, I type something else, whatever it is. So using Vim, first of all, allows you to create your own NeoVim setup, if you want to stick with Vim, but you can also use Vim not only in Vim, uh, Vim bindings are supported by a lot of different tools. So you can use Vim bindings uh, via plugins in the JetBrains IDEs. You can use it in uh, or use Vim bindings in VS Code. You can use them in Jupyter Notebooks. You can use them in Overleaf and RStudio in all sorts of applications. You can use Vim bindings. They're supported. You don't have to stick to the terminal. If you don't like using terminal editors, you can go with PyCharm, IntelliJ, whatever you want to use, and you can use Vim bindings. And I guarantee you, if you train them, they're going to speed up your coding speed, or they're going to increase your coding speed. So this is my motivation for now. And now we're going to talk about the installation. Now, when it comes to the installation, it all depends on what kind of operating system you're working on. If you're working on Linux or Mac, you probably have Vim installed already, or at least you have VI. The difference is that Vim means VI improved. So it's a more recent version, a more improved version. And you can see if you have it by just typing VI. Uh, and if you see here, Vim VI improved, you have Vim installed and also bound to VI. Otherwise, you can try to type Vim. And maybe then it says Vim, and then you know, you have it installed. If it only has VI and it doesn't show you that it's VI improved, so Vim, uh, what you want to do on Linux and Mac is you want to use your package installer to install uh, Vim. So on Debian based distributions, for example, sudo apt install and then Vim, or on Arch based distributions, pacman s Vim, and so on and so forth, depending on your operating system, and then you have it in your terminal. Now on Windows, things are a little bit different. So you can go to the PowerShell, for example, you can install it via the PowerShell and inside of the PowerShell. So then you have an actual uh, terminal editor Vim, you can install it via GVim. So just download the graphical user interface to Vim, or my preferred way of doing it is using the Windows subsystem for Linux. So actually running Linux inside of Windows, not with a virtual box, but with the Windows subsystem for Linux, which is provided by Microsoft. So you just go to the store, you download it, you install it, you can watch a tutorial on that. I'm not going to make one here because this is about Vim. Uh, but you basically install the Windows subsystem for Linux, and then you follow the Linux steps. So just sudo apt install. And then Vim. So this is how you install it. That's it for the installation part. Now we're going to start with the basics. All right, so let us start working with Vim. The first thing we want to do is we want to open a file. And for that, we just type VI or Vim, depending on your aliases, and then a file name, for example, client.c, which is the file from before. Now, in this case, Vim is going to open the file for editing, we can change some stuff, we can save it, we can dismiss changes and so on. If we type some file name or some file path that, that does not exist, what's going to happen is that we're going to create a new file. So if I type not client C, but something like test.txt, this is going to create a new file, this is going to open a blank file. And once I write the changes to the file, this file is going to be created by Vim. 
So let us start now with client.c. And the first question that most people have when they enter Vim is, how do I get out of it? So I'm going to tell you that right away. All you need to do is you need to type colon Q and then enter. Now, the problem is that most people try a lot of things before actually being able to, um, to get some help or someone who tells them how to leave Vim. So they open up a new file, test.txt, and they just press a thousand keys. They don't know what to do uh, and all that. And then someone tells them, okay, press colon Q, and then you're going to leave Vim. However, this is not going to work here because if I press colon Q, enter, you can see that it says no write since last change at exclamation mark to overwrite. So essentially all you need to do in this case is you need to say Q and then exclamation mark. And this is because you want to say with this exclamation mark, you're saying quit, but also dismiss any changes that I made. So if you make any changes, you cannot just quit. Vim is not going to allow that. You have to say, okay, I ignore all the changes. Just forget about those. There you go. The important thing is here that you don't type exclamation mark Q, but Q exclamation mark. And the reason for that is that when you type exclamation mark, and then something, this is a terminal command. So for example, I can say, uh, I don't know, what can I do ls, for example, this is going to give me the ls command from the terminal. And if I type um, exclamation mark Q, this is not going to quit, this is just going to execute a command that is not known, because Q is not a command. So if you want to leave, you just type Q and then exclamation mark if you want to dismiss the changes. What if you don't want to dismiss the changes, let's say I want to open up test.txt, and I want to write something. First of all, how do I write something? Because by default, if I press, for example, the key D, we don't write D's. And also C, we don't write C's. Okay, now we write C's. But if I press C once, we don't write C's. So why is that? And how can we start typing some text? In order to understand this, you need to understand that Vim works with so called modes. So when we open a new file, we are in the normal mode, or when, when we enter Vim, we are in the normal mode. And in the normal mode, every key has its functionality. For example, the colon key starts a command. So if I want to type a command like quit, for example, or write or doing something, um, or setting something, I need to type colon and then whatever I want uh, to execute. And then I press enter to execute that Vim command. So the colon, uh, the, the colon is actually what I press in order to execute a command in the normal mode, because if you're in a different mode, keys have different functionalities. But in a normal mode, if you type colon and something, you execute a command once you press enter. Another key, like D, for example, is for deleting, or A is for appending, and so on and so forth. We're going to talk about those. But the first thing you need to know is that I enters the insert mode. If you press the letter I or the character I, what happens is you get into insert mode. You can see here down on the right, I pressed I am now in the insert mode, which you can see here on the bottom left. Insert mode means that whatever I press now doesn't have a functionality, but it's just text. So I can write stuff here. I can also press I, I don't get into another insert mode, I can press colon, I don't get into command mode. Insert mode means that I can type text. Now, if I want to leave the insert mode again into the normal mode, I press escape. So by pressing escape, we leave the insert mode, and we get into normal mode. And now again, if I type colon, I have a command. And if I type I, I enter the insert mode, escape, get out of it again, and so on. And now I have some text, let's say I want to save this, First of all, if I'm in the insert mode, I need to get out of it by pressing escape. And then I can say colon W, which is for write. So if I want to write the changes into a file, I press W and I can press enter like that. And you can see that uh, these characters were written into the file. However, I can also do write and quit. So for example, let's say I change something here. And I want to say quit and it says no write since last change. I can override it with the exclamation mark again, I can also do WQ. So write and quit. In this case, it writes the changes into the file, and it also quits. So I can go ahead now and open the file again. And you can see that all the changes are still in the file. So this is how you can do basic stuff in Vim. This is how you get into the insert mode. And this is how you get out of the insert mode into the normal mode. Now, each character, as I already said, has different functionality, uh, or has a different functionality. So the insert mode basically means or I basically means I enter the insert mode. But there are multiple keys that enter the insert mode. For example, another one would be a a also enter, uh, enters the insert mode, or O 
or can also enter the insert mode. The difference is how they enter the insert mode. For example, let's say I have here um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I am focusing on the five here. My cursor is above the five and I press I. What you can see is that I, if I type A now, the A is placed between four and five. So when I press I, I go before the cursor, before the actual focused um, number. If I'm focusing the five and now I press A instead of I, I focus on the six. So if I type an A now, you can see that the A ends up between five and six. And if I type O, I open a new line below that line and then I enter the insert mode. So for example, I'm up here and I press O, this creates a new line and I'm in insert mode. And I don't have to be at the end of the line, so it's not like saying enter, uh, because uh, when you say enter, you just go to the end of the line, whatever, you press enter, you also open a new line. It's not the case here. What's the case here is that wherever I am in the line, so even here, I press O, it opens a new line, and I'm in the insert mode. So we have I for inserting before the cursor, A for inserting after the cursor, so appending, and O for opening a new line or for creating a new line below the line. Now, these three characters can also be used with the shift key in order to have uh, capital letters. So capital I, capital A, and capital O. And uh, the functionality here is a little bit different. So for example, if I'm focusing the five and I type shift I, or I press shift I, this enters the insert mode at the beginning of, um, at the beginning of this line. So the A is here no matter where I am. So even if I have multiple words here with spaces and all that, if I'm somewhere in the middle here and I press capital I, what you see is I jump to the beginning of the line and then I type here. The opposite happens with capital A. Capital A goes to the end of the line, appends to the end of the line um, and enters the insert mode. And capital O doesn't open a line below the current line, but above like that. So if I'm here, at this line and I press capital O, it opens a line above and enters the insert mode. So those are the very basic changes, how you can change from the normal mode into the insert mode and from the insert mode into the normal mode, you always press escape basically. Um, this is how you can do that. Now, before we move on to other key bindings, I wanna uh, talk a little bit about settings here because you can see that this is really not an attractive editor and it's not gonna be without plugins. It's, it's not gonna be an attractive editor, but we can make it more attractive. So first of all, what I like to have is some line numbers. If you want to have some line numbers in Vim, what you do is you type colon, set, and then uh, blank or white space, number. Set number basically activates line numbers. So if I press enter now, you can see that we have line numbers on the left. Now, one thing that you're going to see in Vim as we go on over time is that line numbers, or, or actually not line numbers, but numbers can be used to combine key bindings. A very basic example, we're going to talk about more examples. A very basic example is that each action can be repeated x times. So for example, if I press the key down, so the, the arrow key down, uh, I move one line down. But if I type five, and then arrow key down, I move five lines down, I can do the same thing with up. So seven up goes seven lines up. And in this line, I can do it with left and right. So let's say I'm here, I can say 15 right and it jumps 15 characters to the right. By the way, one thing that I want to mention here as well is that and this is something where I'm not actually doing um, the usual thing that you do as a Vim user, especially as a hardcore Vim user. Uh, this is the, the part where I'm probably too soft. I'm using the arrow keys, uh, just because I don't type with 10 fingers yet. Uh, but what you can do in Vim is you can use the H, J, K and L key instead of the arrow keys. So K goes up, J goes down, H goes left and L goes right. So essentially the idea behind that is not some arbitrary keys. Those are four keys in a line. And essentially the reason for using those keys instead of using the arrow keys is that you don't have to leave the main keyboard space. So Vim is all about optimizing your typing speed, your coding speed. So you want to type as fast as possible, you want to use 10 fingers, op uh, optimally, I'm not doing it, but you want to use 10 fingers. And you want to leave this space as seldomly as possible, you don't want to go to the mouse, you don't want to go to the arrow keys, you want to stay there. And this means that you're going to have to use JK, L and H in order to move around instead of the arrow keys. But again, I'm not doing that uh, usually. So 
uh, you, you can do that better. But again, these numbers can be combined also with the J and K. So if I go, if I type K, it goes one up. If I type four K, it goes four up. So you can combine numbers with key bindings in order to, to repeat them. Now, why am I telling you that? Because this happens quite often and a setting, uh, there, there is a certain setting that you can use in order to make this easier uh, with some key bindings. And this setting is called relative number. And not everyone is going to like it. I'm, I'm probably, I'm, I'm pretty sure that most of you who don't use Vim or haven't used Vim yet, you're not going to like this setting, but it is quite useful. And this setting is set relative number. And essentially, instead of getting the absolute line numbers, you get the relative line numbers to the current line. So the, uh, for the current line, you see that you have the line number four, so you get the actual line number. But for the other lines, you get the relative line number. So you can see this line number here or this line here is five lines away. So if I type five down, I jump to that line. And this can be quite useful because this can be combined with deletion. This can be combined with, um, with pasting, with copying and so on. Um, and we're going to talk about this uh, as we go on here, but this is just something that you can activate if you want to, you don't have to, um, but you can use the set relative number setting here, uh, or you can just use the set number setting without the set relative number setting. And we can do a couple of different things. So by default, for example, I cannot use the mouse here. If I want to use the mouse, I have to set the mouse to active. So set mouse equals a, and then I can press around here. I can also scroll. Other things would be, for example, setting the uh, tab stop to four, setting the shift width to four and so on, or choosing a color scheme. So color scheme slate, for example, or you can just type color scheme and then tap to see the different color schemes that we have here. And then you can pick one, enter, and you can change the color scheme. Now, before I show you too many commands here, what happens when I close this here? Let's write and close. What happens is I open Vim up again and all the settings are gone. So you can type whatever you want. You don't have the settings. So if I type set number and I leave and I open it up again, I don't have the numbers anymore. And of course, if you have like 20 settings, you don't want to set them all the time every time you open Vim. So you want to have a settings file, a configuration file that does it for you. And for that, you have the Vim RC file, which is located at the following place. You go to, uh, or actually, I'm not going to see D there. I'm going to, I'm going to Vim there. So I'm going to go with Vim there. Uh, which is the user directory and then slash dot vim rc. Now, this is the file, this is the path. So vim recognizes that path user directory slash dot vim rc. If the file is there, vim loads it or vim is going to open it. If it's not there, you create it and vim is still going to load it. So we're going to open up the vim rc file. In this case, we don't have it. It's a new file. We're going to enter the insert mode and I'm just going to write here a couple of settings set number set relative number, set um, tap stop equal to four, set shift width equal to four, set auto indent. Um, I think most of them, is, uh, except for the, for the first two are self-explanatory, then set mouse equal to A and color scheme slate, for example. So, colon w colon wq whatever and then i can open up now again the vim dot or the test.txt file and you can see that i have the settings loaded i have the relative line numbers i have the line numbers i have the color scheme and i have also the shift width and the tab stop which we cannot see here um but this is how you do it you can create this vimrc file or change this vimrc file every time you want to change uh, change something for example if i say i don't want to use this anymore i want to use something else I can delete the color scheme and go with, uh, what do we have here? Was Delic? Was that a color scheme? I'm not sure. Yeah, or no, actually not. Color scheme, Delic. It was a color scheme, okay. Um, whatever, you can change this config file however you want. I like to use Slate from the default themes. Later on, we can install some with plugins, but those are the very basics. Opening files, closing files, writing to files, entering into the insert mode, leaving the insert mode back into the normal mode, and then also having some basic settings moving around. And those are the very, very basics of Vim. 
All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a lot of Vim key bindings and Vim key functions. And this can be quite a lot of information to digest for a beginner. And it might be frustrating and confusing because you're not going to remember everything at once. I'm going to show a lot here. You don't have to remember everything at once. What I recommend you do is you watch the whole video. And then once you start training Vim, you go to Google and you type Vim cheat sheets or Vim cheat sheet. And then you look for a cheat sheet that um, has a couple of the things that you want to train. For example, I think this one is quite good here uh, from Phoenix NAP. We're not affiliated. Um, and essentially, you can see here moving, inserting, editing, copying, cutting, pasting, marking, and so on. You have the basic commands, the basic key bindings here, and you can train them. You don't have to remember them here from the video. This video is for an overview. You can play around, you can learn the things, but you don't have to remember everything by watching this video. So we're going to start out with the key bindings here. Uh, let's open a file again, not nvim, we're going to use vi test.txt again. And now we have the text that we have here. First of all, let me show you some basic keys like undoing and redoing. Let's say you write something, we're going to use O to open a new line here in the insert mode. And I type Hello World, for example, I use escape to go back to the normal mode. If I want to undo this right now, what I have to do is I cannot do control Z because control Z in the terminal gets you out of um, out, out of the process. So it puts it into the background. So you don't want to do that you want to type U. So just pressing the key U in normal mode, undoes that. So you can see down here, it says, okay, this happened 23 seconds ago, we have two fewer lines now. And this basically un undid the action. Now, if I want to repeat the action, so if I want to redo the action, what I do is I press Control R, Control R redos, and U undoes. So Control R redo. Now let's add a couple of things here. Hello, then maybe what then inserting again here is going to normal again, up question mark going into normal again. Uh, now I can press U, 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 U or control R, R, or control R, control R, control R, control R. And what I can also do is remember, we can combine numbers and commands, I can also say three U to go three undoes back or three redos. Uh, you can see again here what I'm typing. Um, or I can say five U for five undoes. And of course, if there are no undoes to do anymore, you can see already at oldest change. And I can do control R already at newest change. Um, so this is basic undoing and redoing. Now what's also interesting is, uh, this is now not related to undoing and redoing is this is a third mode that we introduce here because this can be quite useful. We know now that we have an insert mode. And we also know that we have a normal mode. So insert again, we enter it with I A or O. And we can leave that with escape. But there's also a third mode called the visual mode and the visual mode is for selecting. Now let's say for example, I'm here now and I want to select this this second word here, even though it's not a word, what I can do is I can press V for visual mode, you can see down here, it says visual. And now if I go right, I select the word. And now I can do certain things with that word, I can delete it, I can copy it, I can uh, cut it, I can I can do a couple of things with that word. So now I have selected it, if I want to delete it, what I do is I press D. D is the deletion key. So if I press D, it deletes something. Um, I can undo it again now with you. And I can also of course, if I'm in the visual mode, I can just press escape. Uh, in this case, twice uh, to to leave the visual mode. So again, selecting this D deletes it. And I can also select just a couple of characters here D deletes those. Now if I want to copy, so I can also take that and press Y. Y is the key that we use for yanking. This is what it's called in, in Vim. And yanking means copying. So if I press Y, it says, uh, or doesn't say anything, but it copied them. And now I can go down here, for example, I can press P, and it enters or it inserts it, it, it pastes basically what I yanked before. Uh, and I can do that a couple of times, I can press P, 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 or I can also press, of course, um, 10, 10 P. There you go. And I can undo all of that again. So every command, almost every command, every key can be combined with a number and then it's going to be repeated. So again, let's select this here with visual mode, Y for yanking and then four P for pasting it four times. Um, and then again, I can also select all of this here and just press D in order to remove it. Now, 
these commands here or these key bindings can be used in different ways. So Y is for yanking, D is for deleting and P is for pasting and I can use them in different ways. So for example, I can select something and I can say D as we did before or I can just press DD to delete the whole line. So undo again, DD deletes the whole line, DD, DD, DD. And of course, again, if I go up here, for example, and I say five DD, it deletes five lines. There you go. Um, same can be done with copying. In this case, it doesn't make a lot of sense to, to copy multiple times, but I can copy full lines. So not just selecting and copying, I can yank a full line by going Y, Y and Y, Y yanks the full line. I can go down here and say P and then I can say also five P and it adds these five lines with line breaks because I yanked the whole line. So also the line break. Um, that is that. What else do we have? I can use paste in the uppercase way. So I can also, this is the same as O, uppercase O and lowercase O. If I copy, let's say this line here and I now say P, it pastes it below the what. If I say uppercase P, it goes above that. Uh, and of course, also, if I if I copy just a word without um, without these new line characters, I can press P to to paste at the end of the uh, at the end of the of the cursor and I can paste uh, I can press uh, capital P to go before that. So same thing as I and A essentially. Uh, so that is that. Now, sometimes what we want to do is we don't want to delete a line. We want to change a line. So the difference between deleting and changing is not too much. It's essentially the same thing, but the difference is that we enter the insert mode when we change. So if I just want to delete this line, I press DD and the line is gone. If I want to delete the line, but also change it. So I want to change what the line is. I press CC and this changes the line. So you can see the line is not vanished. I'm in the insert mode and I can type some stuff here. So CC enters the insert mode and doesn't delete the line, whereas DD deletes the full line here. Um, and C can also be used in the visual mode. So I can select, for example, here the world and I can press C and you can see I'm still in insert mode and I can type. Whereas if I select this and I type D, I leave the visual mode. I'm in normal mode and not in insert mode. So those are the differences. And we can also use the uppercase characters. So I can type, um, for example, if I'm here now and I press uppercase D, this deletes the rest of the line, not the full line. If you want to delete the full line again, DD. If you want to delete just a part of the line, namely the last part from this cursor up until the end, capital D deletes the rest of the line and capital C changes the rest of the line. That is that. But I think uppercase Y, as far as I know, copies the full line. Yeah, uppercase Y doesn't copy the rest of the line, but the full line. So uppercase Y is essentially the same as YY. Um, that is that. And last but not least, when it comes or last, but, last but not least for the deletion and the replacing is actually the replacing um, character, which is R. So let's say I'm here with hello, and I want to change the H, what I can do is I can just press R, and R means replace. And if I now press K, you can see that it says Kello instead of hello. Now, what's 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 the purpose of that? The purpose is just that I can use the R key and I don't have to um, delete and then enter a new character because in ordinary editors, what you do is you go into the insert mode or you don't go into the insert insert mode. You already have the insert mode. You delete one character and you replace it. So I delete the H and I press the K to enter it in Vim. I can just press R and then H to change the K to an H. So that's that. Now, all these things like deleting, changing, copying, and so on can be used more efficiently if we have some keys or some key functions that allow us to move in an advanced way. And this is what we're going to introduce next. Let's say we have a simple sentence here. Hello, I am a simple sentence, period. What I can do now is, of course, I can use the arrow keys or H, J, K, L to move around here. Um, but what I can also do is I can jump words, for example. So this is this is something that I can do in in Vim, I can jump words forwards and backwards. So if I'm here, I can just press W to jump to the next word, I can press W again to jump to the next word, and so on and so forth. I press W and it jumps to the next word. Uh, essentially word meaning 
Uh, I'm not sure what the exact definition is. But as far as I know, word means either a space or some special character in between. So I think if you have something like Hello, I am a simple sentence, even though we don't have a blank here, this should, I think no, in this case, it doesn't um, consider that as multiple words. But I think if we have now I'm using by the way, the R to to change the individual characters here. I think that if I use hyphens as hyphens, as you can see, uh, those are considered to be individual words. However, if I go and use uppercase W, this is one word. So if I have something here, uppercase W says this is one word, and those are individual words. So the basic difference is that if you use uppercase W, you jump um, or a word is considered to be something that is separated by by spaces. So if there's no space, it's considered to be one word, whereas the lowercase W considers also stuff like hyphens to be uh, separators for words. Now, the same thing can be done backwards. So if I'm here, and I want to go back a word, I basically just type B. So B, 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 or if I want to consider this a full word, I can type uppercase B. So uppercase B, there you go, this is one word. So the same thing that W does forwards, B does backwards. Um, now, why is this useful? This is useful because we can use it together with the things that we learned about already. And this is where Wim, uh, Vim gets very, very interesting. Now, for example, the D key is the deletion key. And what exactly I delete can be specified. So for example, again, if I mark something in the visual mode, this is what I'm deleting. If I press DD, I'm deleting the whole line. But what I can also do is I can say DW, delete a word, DW deletes a word. And of course, I can say to DW, delete two words. Or in this, in this case, it was basically two times delete a word, I can also say D two W for delete two words. Essentially, this means that where am I when I say two W, it jumps there, everything up until this point is deleted. So D two W delete two words. Um, or also, if I'm at this point here, I can say delete to B to go two words backwards and delete uh, the respective words. However, you will notice that if I'm in the middle of a word and I say DW, it won't delete the full word, but just the remaining part of the word. If I want to delete the full word, I have to type delete in a word. So D I W delete in a word. Um, and same goes for change. So for example, if I'm somewhere here, and I want to say, Okay, I want to change this here to something else, the rest is okay. Uh, I just type C I W change in a word, and I can type something instead. Now you may say, uh, you may say now that this is not really useful, because who needs that and all, all that. But this is actually quite useful. I use it on an everyday basis when I use a uh, jet brain environment when I use VS code when I use NeoVim. doesn't really matter. I constantly use these key bindings, because they really speed up your code, or they really increase your coding speed. Um, so remember, you can specify the movements using W and B or also one thing that I didn't introduce yet, uh, yet is E, E jumps to the end of a word. So if I type E, it jumps to the end of a word. And also we have uh, the same thing for the line. So if I want to jump to the beginning of the line, uh, as a movement, not as inserting. So remember, with capital I, I can go to the beginning of a line into the insert mode. But if I just want to jump there to specify, for example, for the lead command, I press zero, zero goes to the beginning of a line, and the dollar symbol goes to the end of the line. Again, all this, you don't have to remember it right now. Just hear about this, and then you can look it up in a cheat sheet again. But what's the interesting part here is that if I'm here, for example, and I type D zero, everything up until or everything to the beginning, or everything until the beginning is being deleted from the current point. And the same thing goes if I'm here, for example, and I say D dollar, D dollar basically means delete until the end of the line. And I can do the same thing with the end of the word. So I can say D E, which is actually the same thing as saying DW in this case. Um, but this is what we can do here. And uh, with with uh, capital E, we can do the same thing with uh, words only considered to be words if they have uh, spaces around them, or actually not accepting any other uh, separators except for spaces. So again, a lot of information to digest here. So I'm going to repeat it, you can jump around with W, you can jump around with B, and you can combine these jumps, you can also jump around with E, 
Uh, you can combine all of these jumps with deletion, with copying, and with uh, changing and all sorts of things. So for example, let's say I want to copy this word here and I'm in the middle of the word. What I do is I say Y I W yank inner word. And then I can go down here, for example, P and I now have the word copied here. Again, this is very useful because oftentimes you are coding right now, you don't want to leave the keyboard and you're here now and you want to change this. Okay, just C I W. There you go. I don't have to do the the, okay, let's select all this here and let's press uh, delete, the delete key here, and then let's type something else. I can just, while I'm in the middle of the word, I can just type something like, now I have to jump to the word, I can just type C I W and I change it, right? Um, now, where this gets really interesting is when we go into parentheses and brackets and other symbols. So, for example, you might have some Python function print. Hello world, this is my stupid message. And since the message is stupid, you want to delete it, you want to change it, and you're inside of these parentheses. Now, what you usually do is, first of all, you go to the beginning, then you use the uh, the shift key and the arrow keys to mark all of that, or maybe you use the mouse to select all of this here, and then you delete it. What you can do here with Vim is you can just go somewhere into, into the middle, and you type C, I, and then uh, quotation marks, change inner quotation marks, and you can type something else, right? Change inner quotation marks. So if you don't want to change it, you can also say, um, delete inner quotation marks without entering the insert mode. Or you can also say, um, yank inner quotations, and then you can paste it somewhere, right? So this is just very convenient. And you can do the same thing with, uh, with parentheses, with square brackets, with curly brackets. So for example, if I want to, if, uh, if I want to change everything here inside of the parentheses, I just type C I change inner parentheses, and I can use the opening or closing parentheses is or bracket, it doesn't really matter. So again, hello world, then maybe we have multiple parameters, ABC, one, two, three, whatever, I want to change all this here, just C I, and then opening bracket. So this can be very, very useful. And I use this quite often. Uh, what else do we have here? Now we can combine all of this again with numbers. I think I mentioned this already, but everything that I show you here can be combined with numbers. So I delete five words, and I can also five times delete five words, you can do whatever you want, actually. Um, and you can also copy five lines, so you can say five y y, then p and you have copied five lines and so on. All this can be combined with numbers. Now, let's look at a couple of different things. And for this, maybe let's go to the uh, to the client C file. Here, we can see how this is useful. I showed it already in the motivation. Now, let's say I want to change the function signature here. I'm not I'm not going to do anything meaningful here. But let's say I want to change the parameters here, CI parentheses, there you go. Now, also, there's another operator that we haven't talked about yet, or another key that we can press here. Um, if I'm at this if I'm focusing on this uh, curly bracket here, so here, and I want to know, okay, where is the closing one? First of all, it's displayed here, you can see that it's highlighted, but also I can jump to it by using the percentage sign. So I can type percent to jump to that place. And of course, if I have uh, huge functions, like I should have one down here, here, this is the opening bracket. And if I type percent, I go to the closing bracket. And if I type it again, I jump up again. So this is very, very useful for jumping. And of course, guess what happens when I type D percent, it deletes everything, including the bracket that we have uh, down there. Um, yeah, so another jump that we can do is we can jump not a word or uh, not to a certain, certain um, bracket that is closing, but to a certain character. So for example, you might say, okay, I'm here. And I want to delete everything until the next star symbol comes. So I just type, or actually, before we start deleting, let's jump to the next uh, star symbol. How do I do that? I say T star, T star gets me to the position before the symbol that I specify. So if I'm somewhere here in the same line, by uh, in the same line, by the way. So if I say T star, I jump one position before the star. If I say F star, this is find, it jumps to that position. So that's a difference. Why is that important? Um, because let's say I want to delete this switch here. 
Now, in this case, it's just a word. But let's say we have a couple of more things. I have some nonsense here, whatever. And I want to delete everything up until the opening bracket. What I can do is I can say D, T, and opening bracket. And then it deletes everything up until this point. If I do the same thing with F, it's a problem because then it's going to also delete the bracket. So I can say uh, D, F, opening bracket, and then we don't have the bracket anymore. So maybe that's not what we want to do. But T and F are for finding or jumping one position before that. So T jumps one position before the specified symbol, uh, before the next occurrence, uh, occurrence in the same line of the specified symbol, and F jumps onto that. That's the difference here. Now, um, I think what capital T does, what does capital T do? Oh, yeah, capital T goes backwards. So capital T and capital F do the same thing, just backwards. So T, or lowercase t and star jumps to the next star and uppercase t and star jumps before to the or after the previous star, you could say so you can see one position after that. And if I type capital F star, it jumps to the star that comes before the current cursor. Uh, that is that. And again, this can be combined with with deleting with yanking, I can also say, for example, I want to copy everything up until the opening uh, curly bracket, there you go. So I basically typed uh, in this case, oh, by the way, you, you see here, I, I just noticed that you see here, control alt D seven, this is just because on my keyboard, I'm using a, a German layout. Uh, this was just a curly bracket. So if I type switch, uh, if I if I type uh, yank, T, and then curly bracket, and I pay uh, and I press P now this copied exactly what I wanted to copy. So this is how we can use that. Um, and one last thing for this section here that I want to show you is how to jump uh, to the beginning of a file to the end of a file and to a certain line number. So we're somewhere here right now 291. If I want to jump to the beginning of the file, I type GG. So lowercase GG like good game. And if I want to jump to the end of the line or to the end of the file, I type uh, shift G and it goes to the end. And if I want to jump to a specific line, I can type that line. So for example, one, two, three, and uppercase G, then I jump to that, or I can use a command. So I can type colon 406, enter and it jumps to that line. So I would say that what we have covered up until now are the basics of Vim. So the fundamental key bindings, the fundamental commands, and so on. And now we're going to move to some more intermediate stuff. Now, once you start actually practicing Vim, so actually using Vim on a daily basis to practice it, um, I would recommend focusing on the fundamentals first and then moving on to the intermediate stuff. But for this video, you can keep watching to get an overview. But once you start training, focus on the fundamentals first. So for the intermediate stuff, we're going to cover a quite diverse set of things. So we're going to talk about some uh, indentation formatting stuff, we're going to talk about searching, we're going to talk about replacing. Um, and I want to start here with the indentation. So with the shifting offline. So for example, let's say I'm in this line here, line, line number 400, I want to shift it to the right, or I want to indent it to the right. Now, before I show you the command, I want to mention that the program here on the bottom right doesn't translate these keys correctly. So I hope that uh, this is not too confusing. Essentially, what I'm pressing here is in order to shift a line that I'm currently at to the right, I use two times the closing bracket. Now this translates properly, but the opening bracket doesn't translate properly. So this is the opening bracket for me. So look here, not here to the bottom uh, right. Um, and if I use this here, so the first line, this indents to the right, as you can see, and this here indents to the left. So if I do this all the time, it indents to the left. And these things now, so you have to press twice if you're just at the line, if you have selected the line, you can just press it once. So if I use the visual mode to select this here, um, I think I just have to press once and then it's going to indent it and I can select it again and I press once back to put it to the left. Now, at this point, I also want to mention that there are multiple visual modes. Now, up until now, we have only used just the normal visual mode, just pressing V and selecting some some area here. We can also use the visual line mode and the visual block mode, the visual line mode, I think it's quite self self explanatory, we press shift V, and we select lines. So we cannot select parts of lines, we select full lines like that. And then we can just pr uh, press Y and then press P and, and paste that part and all that. Um, 
but essentially that that is the, the visual line mode. The visual block mode is something that I have to admit don't use too often, but it can be quite useful if you need it. It's essentially the same thing as the line mode, but column wise. So I can press control V to go into the uh, in this case, I think, okay, this doesn't work in this case, because I have overwritten it. All right, so the problem was with the Windows terminal, not with Vim. Uh, so I opened up another terminal here, and I'm going to open another file here. Uh, when you are in a file in normal mode, and you press Control V, you enter the visual block mode, and you can select column wise like that. And then you can press D to delete the columns and so on. Um, this is not what you do in a visual mode. And this is not what you do in the visual line mode. This is what you do in the visual block mode, which is control V and then you select um, all these lines here. As you can see, and now we can change them. And we can, uh, or we can delete them. And uh, yeah, in this case, we changed them. So we entered also at all these lines something. Alright, so back in the previous editor, we can not only shift lines manually by shifting them left and right, we can also automatically indent. And this works better with languages like C or Java that have um, brackets around their code. It doesn't work too well with Python, because then again, you don't know, okay, what's the proper indentation? Do I have to indent here or not? But in this case, let's say we have a badly formatted code. So let's say this is somewhere here, which is still correct code, right? But it's it's just ugly. Uh, and maybe we have something here. Oh, how can I do this here? Like that. And maybe we have something like that and like that. Now, if I want to auto indent a line, I just have to go to that line and type the equal sign. So not less than not uh, greater than just equal twice. So if I type equal twice, um, this is indented correctly. There you go. And let me just reverse this here. This can also be done for uh, an area. So let me just repeat the mess here. And I can just use the visual line mode to select a section. And then once I have selected a section, I just type, um, I, I just press the equal sign, and you can see everything is indented. And this also works with the full file. So I can combine now a couple of things here, let me just mess up the code a little bit. And let's remember the line here where all of this starts here 406. Now in order to auto indent the full file, what I do is I type GG to move to the beginning of the file, then I type equals and then capital G to move to the end of the file. So indent up until the end of the file. And now this was what was it 406 G. There you go, everything is indented properly here. So this worked. This is auto indentation. Now let us move to searching. Searching is basically like jumping, but instead of just jumping to the next character that you find, you jump to the next search term and searching in Vim is done using the slash uh, characters. So it's done like a colon, you will see that something pops up down in the bottom if you type slash. And here you can type for example, hello. And if I press enter, in this case, it doesn't find hello, because in this code, we don't have hello. But maybe if I type URL, it finds URL in this case. Now this is one URL, if I want to jump to the next URL that it finds, I press n. So n jumps to the next. And I can do this a couple of times, I can jump through all the URLs here. There you go, there you go, there you go. And I can also go back. So if I want to go to the previous, I go capital N, capital N to go back up. And then just escape. Uh, or actually doesn't really matter escape because URL stays uh, safe here. Now, in some color schemes, this is going to stay marked, you just type slash again, and you enter some nonsense. There are some fancy ways to reset it. But this is basically how everyone does it. Um, if you want to search backwards, so not the next occurrence, but the previous occurrence, you use the question mark, so question mark URL. And uh, you basically the normal n basically moves up now and the capital n moves down now. So this is just the reverse of that. Um, what we can also do is we can select a token. Um, how does this work? Let me just type something else here so that we reset it. So if I press n, we don't find URL now. Now I can select URL and I can type uh, hashtag. Oh, actually, this is still individual mode. Now I have this token, I type hashtag to find the next occurrence of that token. So hashtag goes um, up in this case, again, this this doesn't translate properly, it says that I'm pressing a uh, question mark. So don't be confused by that. But uh, this hashtag basically means moving up. Um, and if I go with star, 
star goes to the next one. So star goes to the next occurrence of the token. So here, if I go to length and I press star, it goes to the next length, length, length. There you go. Um, and hashtag goes up again. Again, hashtag, what I'm actually typing here is this character here, not the question mark. Um, so that is that. What do we ha have else? Now we can we can do something quite interesting, which is marking locations and jumping to those locations. So let's say, for example, um, I frequently revisit a function for some reason, for example, extract host name here, and especially this line 130, this cursor here, I come here quite often, what I can do is I can mark that as a waypoint. So I can set a waypoint by typing M and I can now choose a character, for example, uh, M A would would mark this as being the mark A. And if I now am at a certain different position here, and I want to jump to a certain waypoint, I just press this uh, single quotation mark here, and then a and then it jumps there. And I can also go to a different point here, for example, extract full status to this string copy here, M and I can type G. So MG in this case, now I go somewhere else and I can type single quotation A single quotation G. And this can be used to mark important sections in the code to jump through them and to not have to scroll all the time or remember line numbers, you can just say, okay, uh, jump to the waypoint A, there I have a certain piece of code jump to waypoint K, there I have a certain code section and so on, you can navigate through large code files using these uh, waypoints. Now, another little thing that we can do is we can center the current selection. So if I'm down here, you can see it doesn't scroll necessarily just because I move my mouse here, or move my cursor here. Uh, if I want to center the current line, so I want to move it up into the screen, I just type ZZ. So two times lowercase z, and then it's centered. And this, and this can be quite useful, especially if you have something like uh, a new file. Um, let's just remove all this here. And now let's say I go down somewhere. And I don't really have anything to scroll down to. Uh, what I can do is I can type ZZ to still center that even though there are no lines below that. So let us move back to the C file. The last two things that I want to show you here for the intermediate category are searching and replacing. So basically just substituting and repeating a command. So substituting strings and repeating commands. Um, and for that, let's take some string that occurs quite often, for example, character here, you can see character occurs quite often. Let's take that and replace each occurrence with another string. How do we do that in Vim with a command? So we need to type colon, and then percent to make it in the full file, not just in a selection, not just in a current line, but in the full file. And then we type s for substitute slash for character, and then slash and let's replace character with symbol, for example, a synonym, and then slash G. And once we do that, I press enter, and you can see all the occurrences here have changed across uh, all lines in the full file. Now, let's say I want to do something similar, but just in a selection, let's say I want to select this area here. And uh, let's say, do we have a word that occurs a couple of times? Um, Let's just take symbol again and do it do it, and, and rename it to something else. Now, we select that and then we type again, colon. And this time we don't use percent, we just use s, we don't want to do it in the full file, we just want to do it in the selection. So s slash symbol slash something slash g, there you go, here it changed, here it didn't change. So this is how you do that. And the last thing that I want to show you here for the intermediate category is repeating a command. This is actually quite simple. Let's say I delete a line by typing DD. All I need to do in order to delete another line is to press the period or the dot. So the point basically, this executes the command that I just executed. So this just repeats the command. But this is not a macro. This is just the last command. So this is just a single command, not a sequence of commands. So also, for example, if I say, uh, change until, or let's let's go here, for example, yeah, let, let's do it here. Um, delete until the um, quotation, I do it here. And now I can go somewhere else, maybe we have uh, some similar. Let's say here, for example, I just press period, and it does the same thing. So this is just um, repeating the command. 
So the last thing that I want to talk about here when it comes to Vim bindings and Vim commands is macros and registers. And this is quite an interesting topic because um, essentially whenever we delete something or whenever we, we copy something, whenever we yank something, you could say, this is stored into a register. And we can see the list of registers in Vim by typing the command colon rec. So colon rec, enter, and you can see here the individual registers. You can see the name of the register and you can see the content of that specific register. Um, now, one thing I'm not sure if I mentioned that whenever you delete something using D, it is also copied. So if I say, uh, if I if I go to a certain line here, for example, return negative one, and I say DD, I delete that line, but I can also paste it again, because it is also copied. So deleting in Vim means copying at the same time. So basically deleting means cutting, you could say. Um, and if you want to have multiple clipboards in, in Vim, you basically have that because if I delete something, and if I copy something, I have the different registers that store these things. Now I can also let's let's go ahead again and see rec here. I can also choose a certain register to paste from. So for example, if I want to paste this here, the register seven, return the full status length, this is a comment. If I want to do that, all I have to do is not just press P in order to paste, but before that press uh, quotation mark seven P. So take the register quotation mark seven and paste from that. I can do the same thing with copying, I can go to that line and say quotation mark seven Y Y to yank the line into seven register, there you go seven get host name length function. So this is how that works. Oh, I actually didn't want to leave that file. Um, and there's some special registers, for example, the register with uh, with the name quotation mark plus essentially means that, uh, or essentially represents the clipboard whenever you copy something in your system, provided that Vim is integrated with your system, of course. Um, but when you copy something, it is stored in the register, uh, which is quotation mark plus, this is the register. So you can use that to copy into the clipboard from Vim or to paste uh, from the clipboard in Vim. This is something you can do. And also something that's quite interesting is again, when you delete something, you already have it ready for pasting. But what for example, if I want to just copy this line here, so the static int, I just type y y to yank that line. So I can paste it, as you can see. But I also want to delete that line and still paste what I just copied. So I want to delete here, if I just pay, uh, if I just press P, uh, I just press P and I and I paste what I just deleted. Um, if I want to paste the last thing that I copied that I actually yanked, I have to use the zero register. So I type, uh, what was it? So, um, quotation mark, zero P and it pastes the last thing that I actually yanked, not that was copied by cutting or deleting. This is important. Now, when it comes to macros, macros are actually also stored in registers, and we can store them in registers manually. So a macro is essentially just a sequence of Vim bindings of Vim actions, you could say, for example, uh, what could be such a thing, I could go here to a certain line, and the macro would be delete, delete three words, there you go. And then uh, go to the end of the line and add 100, for example, whatever, this is a stupid macro doesn't have any value. But if I want to record that macro, what I do is I press Q to to define that I want to start recording a Q a means record the macro a and you can see down here recording a and now I can do whatever I want to do. So every action I take now is going to be part of the macro. For example, delete three words, capital A to jump at the end of the line into insert mode, and then 100 escape. Now I want to quit the macro, Q, quit recording. Now the macro is stored in A. And I think we should also see that in the register here, you can see that the macro uh, that the register A has D three W A 100 as a macro, this is those are the keys that I just typed. And they're now stored in the macro A. If I want to execute that macro, all I need to do is I need to to use the at symbol. So the mail symbol, I hope this is translated correctly here. Okay, it isn't in my case. Um, but essentially, this is what you get on American keyboards by pressing shift and two. So essentially, just this at sign here, this is what you press. And uh, what you do in order to execute the macro is you go to a line where you want to execute it, for example, this line here, and you type at a. And as you can see, deleted three words and added 100 at the end of the line. 
again, at a, at a, and so on. And I think we should even be able to use uh, the, the point now. Yeah, we can use even the period now. No, actually not. This is just repeating the last character. Forget what I said, just at a and at a. This executes the macro. And of course, what you can do here uh, is you can also define a macro B that does something else. And then you can define a macro C that executes macro A and B. So you can you can combine them. You can you can have a so-called you could say composite pattern where you have um, one macro using five other macros that again use five other macros. So you can make pretty complicated things here. And this can be quite useful. I have used it a couple of times already. Um, and those are, I would say, the basic intermediate and advanced things that you need to know about Vim itself. Now, finally, last but not least, I want to show you how you can take the simple primitive Vim and turn it into an actual advanced editor into something maybe even approximating an IDE with a lot of plugins. And before you do that, though, keep in mind that if you're starting out with Vim, if you're learning it for the first time, I recommend you stick to the vanilla version for the first couple of weeks. So you just learn the basic Vim stuff, the basic Vim key bindings, the basic Vim functions and settings and commands and all that. And you don't bother using some plugins because those themselves have different commands and different key bindings and different settings and so on. So focus on the basics. And once you have the basics down, you can you can install some plugins, you can you can uh, customize your setup. Now, in order to do this, what we need to do first here, or what is recommended to do first here is to install NeoVim instead of Vim. NeoVim is just better, faster, and it supports more plugins that Vim does not support. So if you want to have um, a better experience, and you still want to keep using Vim in the terminal, I recommend you use NeoVim. And for that, we type sudo app install NeoVim on Linux, I have this installed already. And in my case, if I now type NeoVim, it opens a NeoVim full of plugins. You can see here in a second, it opens dashboard, it opens a couple of things. Your NeoVim, when you install it, will look probably like the basic Vim. Uh, just it's going to say NeoVim instead of Vim. So in order to install plugins, what you need to do is you need to go to the browser, you need to go to Google, and you need to type VimPlug. Or you can just go to the link here, getup.com slash June gun slash Vim dash plug. And then you can uh, read the instructions here. All you need to do once you have NeoVim installed is you copy this here on Unix and Linux. So also on Windows, if you're using the Windows subsystem for Linux, you're copying that, pasting it, running it, and that's it. Then you have Vim plug installed, basically. Um, and one thing that you need to know is that the NeoVim config is not a Vim RC file. So it's not using the same config as uh, the basic Vim installation, the NeoVim config is located in the user directory slash dot config. And uh, then here, I think it was, was it NeoVim or was it NVim? I think it was NVim, right? There you go. And here we have a file called or usually you don't have a file, you need to create one called init.vim. So cat init.vim. This is my file. This is the content of my file here. So usually you don't have the nvim directory and you also don't have the init.vim file. So you create it, uh, you create both of them, you create the directory and you create the init.vim file. And this is actually what is going to be used. Now you can see that my file here is quite comprehensive. You don't need to understand anything that's written here. This is my config, but the basic structure is quite simple. So first of all, what you see up here is the commands that we already talked about, you know, tap stop, smart tab, auto and then no, we didn't talk about smart tab, uh, whatever number relative number, all that. Then down here, you can see a bunch of settings that you don't need to understand the they are plugin specific. For example, here, I have a plugin called Vim text, and it has some certain uh, parameters or settings that I want to pass here. Uh, I have set certain icons up here, all details that don't matter to you right now. What you need to understand is that there is this section here, once you have Vim plug installed, what you can do is you can type call plug hashtag begin, and then call plug hashtag end. And in between now this is actually not on the right place here. So ignore that. Um, but in between those two commands, we install the plugins by typing pluck, and then the link to the GitHub repository. That's literally all we need to do in order to install or to actually to, to say that we want to install them plugins in order to actually install them, we need to type colon plug install like that colon plug install, and then it's going to open up on the left here, the plug installation, in my case, it says already installed, already installed, already installed. Um, 
And all these things here, all these plugins are just GitHub repositories. Vim Surround is a GitHub repository. Nurtree, which is the thing you see on the left here, this is Nurtree, just a, uh, a, a uh, GitHub repository. So all you need to do is you need to go to the repository, which is a Vim plugin, you copy the link, you type plug, there you go. And then, so you have the section call plug begin, call plug end in between plug and the link. And then essentially you go in and you say plug install and it so installs the plugin. Then maybe you have to rerun and then the plugins are activated. And what you do with the individual plugins, so which color schemes you choose, what settings the plugins have, I cannot make a tutorial on that because each plugin is unique. So Nurtry has certain things to set up. Vim commentary has different things to set up. But all these plugins have functionalities. For example, with Vim commentary, I can just go to a couple of lines, I can mark them, and I can type GC to comment them out. And this is across multiple different programming languages. So this is not a default Vim key binding, this is an advanced thing that's, that is introduced with Vim commentary. Vim airlines, which you see down here. So I don't want to talk too much about specific plugins here. Those are my plugins. And I also have on my GitHub repository, I can show you that. For those of you who are interested on my GitHub, I have so on github.com slash neural nine, I have my config files for those of you who want to have my installation. But keep in mind that so you go to config files, you go to init vim, keep in mind, this is a pretty advanced setup. Oh, this is actually an outdated version. So maybe pick this one, it's it's a little bit more lightweight. Uh, but you're going to have to go through some in installation steps, maybe you have to install node, maybe you have to install a language server and all that. But those are the plugins I use, you can just go online type top 10 vim plugins to install, install those and that's it. And the good thing is that this is not one IDE or one editor that you download like VS code, and then you install some plugins. This is your thing. This is how you design it. So with those plugins and my settings, I have a unique setup that no one else has, unless of course, they copy my config. But you can have your setup the way you want it. And this is very awesome. This is how you can set up NeoVim to be actually something approximating an IDE. Now using Vim or NeoVim as your actual editor is fine, but oftentimes you're going to make use of Pytrum, you're going to use IntelliJ, you're going to use RStudio, you're going to use a Jupyter Notebook, you're going to use uh, Overleaf and so on. And most tools out there, since Vim is really an awesome tool and a lot of people like it, support Vim bindings, either natively or through a plugin. So for example, in Pytrum here, for Python development, you can go to File, to Settings, and you can go to plugins and you can download the idea of plugin, you can install the idea of plugin. And once you have that in Pytrum, you can use Vim key bindings. Now, of course, you cannot install 1000 plugins here because this is Pytrum, this is not Vim, you cannot uh, install Nurtry and all that, but you can use the Vim bindings. So I'm here in Pytrum. And I can say, for example, change inner parentheses, there you go, undo with you. Um, I can use visual mode here, I can press C in order to change and all that. So all these things work here, all the basic key bindings work also in PyCharm, also in Overleaf, also in RStudio and Jupyter Notebook, all that. And for the IntelliJ products or for the JetBrains products, so IntelliJ, PyCharm and so on, uh, you also have an actual VimRC file, which is called IdeaRC. So you go to your users directory, and then you go to idea VimRC. And they offer actually two plugins. So they offer surround and commentary Surround and commentary are actually Vim plugins. And you cannot use plug install here. So you cannot use Vim plug in PyCharm, but you can use surround and commentary. So commentary is basically what I told you, you select a couple of lines and you type GC and it comments them out. Or you just go to a single line and just type GCC to comment the line out. This works also in PyCharm by setting uh, setting the commentary and surround is basically surrounding a word. So for example, if I pick this one here, I think it was y s w or actually y s inner w quotation marks like that. This is basically for surrounding, not too important. But this is what I do on on a regular basis. I use NeoVim sometimes if I just edit some some small scripts or something. But if I use an IDE, if I use uh, PyCharm, if I use IntelliJ, what, whatever I do, unless maybe Microsoft Office, so unless unless I, I do some word stuff, I always use uh, use Vim bindings everywhere. 
and this speeds up your code. So you don't have to use Vim, even if you don't like the terminal, even if you don't want to use Vim in the terminal, I recommend starting to use Vim bindings in your other IDEs, including Visual Studio Code. So that's it for this Vim course. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something. If so, let us know by hitting a like button and leaving a comment in the comment section down below. Besides that, don't forget to subscribe to Free Code Camp and maybe you're also interested in checking out my channel, Neural9. I make a lot of videos on data science, machine learning, Python, and so on. So if you're interested, take a look. And besides that, thank you for watching. See you and bye.